Hello there, YouTube. I am Necrostevo, and it is time for week five in season three of the Pokemon Premier League. Thank you all so much for joining me this week. And last week, we came off of a loss. It is a new week, and the very recent new moon has awakened power yet untapped for the Victorian Shadows. So who is the first victim of our power? Why that would be the Detroit Steel Wings, coached by Seabad. Of course, his information is in the description, but you all should be well, well aware of the accolades our opponent has. In addition to besting us in the last season of the Pokemon Premier League, Seabad has fought across various leagues and has even completed incredibly difficult Nuzlocks and will be a very, very tough opponent for us to face this week. But what he's not counting on is us tapping into the power of the new moon. Now up force, of course we will go through our team, but if you do not want to stick around for the team builder, which why wouldn't you? There will be a link to jump directly to the battle. To review the Detroit City Steel Wings team, we have Sneasler, Rillaboom, Ogre Pond, Hearthflame, Hatterene, Zoroark in its Hisuian form, Inteleon, Incineroar, Rhyperior, Lantern, and Fortress. His Terra captains are the Inteleon which can Terra into a Water-type or a Grass-type, and the Rhyperior, who of course can go into a Water-type or a Fairy-type. For this matchup, you will notice that this is not unlike one of the very same matchups that we had last season. Of course, at that time it was Mounte who had access to Sneezer and Rillaboom, so we do have some experience here. Now, what are we bringing What's the mage? Who are the members of the Horrible Horde? Who's the tank? This week. This week, we will have our dedicated lead, our Kaludon. Now, our Kaludon has a very interesting spread. With our Kaladon, I ended up putting on maximum defense, with the rest going into special attack and a little bit in speed. The reason for this is because he has myriad physical attackers. And with all these physical attackers, I honestly did not know what to expect when it came to who he was going to bring to the battle and also how he was going to run it. Similarly to Mephesto, there are just so many options here that it makes it very difficult to plan and prep for any given uh, outcome. So once again, Instead of trying to plan and prep for everything, we're just going to go into the shadows and execute our game plan. Now in this matchup, I was originally going to lead with Darkrai, but I decided to make Arcaladon my guaranteed lead because of the mind games between the Hisuian Sam, uh, not Samurai, the Hisuian Zoroark and his other teammates. If I lead Arcaladon, then if I see the Hatterene, I'm going to flash cannon it. And I do not care if it's Zoroark or if it is the actual Hatterene. If I do not see the Hatterene, then I am immediately going to go for Stealth Rock. If you look at his team, you can see that there is not good hazard control. Fortress is very reliable hazard control between sturdy, heavy duty boots and being able to spin. But because of its speed and lower special defense, it's easier to pressure. So Fortress, if it came to this battle, I honestly didn't even see it having the ability or the time to spin. It might be setting up screens or something like that instead. But our Caledon can hit everything here. Now, I went with Electroshot Power Herb in on the very, very unlikely thing that I would see a lead Sneasler. If I saw Sneasler or Fortress in that lead shot, then I want to just shoot them immediately in the face with the bridge. And that's why I invested so much into that special attack stat. On the speed there, we just have a little bit of speed in order to make sure that um, 
we can outrun some of his base 85 Pokemon that match me. Um, ideally, the Rillaboom. Also, if something like Incineroar happens to run max speed, if I run this lower speed investment, I will outspeed it as well. But I didn't really anticipate that happening. Our next Pokemon that we have in this matchup is going to be Annihilate. Once again, we have maximum defense on Annihilate. We do not have a very good swap in to Sneasler, Rillaboom, uh, and even Ogre Pond, Hearth Flame. And Ogre Pond is another reason why I didn't bother bringing Sturdy on my Arcaludon. Because um, Mold Breaker, Ogre Pond, Hearth Flame's ability, would allow it to ignore the abilities that my Pokemon have. So my Clod Sire having Unaware doesn't matter. He can set up and then Swords Dance and Trailblaze and smash it in the face. My uh, Arcaludon having Sturdy. Doesn't matter, he can literally break the whole bridge in one hit if he has a low kick um, or has a Swords Dance and powers it up there. So I figured here, why bother with all that if I can just put maximum defense on there and then do my best to try to play around them. Now on Annihilate, we have Covert Cloak. You can see there that the Sneezer can kind of throw off Dire Claws pretty easily against my team. And if I can prevent his Sneezer from getting Dire Claw secondary effects, then I really don't have that much to fear with Annihilate swapping in on Sneezer unless he runs Acrobatics with the Grassy Terrain and the Grassy Seed. Because then I'll give him a defense boost and he'll have a non-item boosted Acrobatics which would mean it's 110 base power. And I do not want to get hit by that. But with maximum defense and HP investment, this Annihilate can not only take hits from the Sneasler, the Rillaboom, and the Ogre Pond, but it can even take some special hits from the likes of the Zoroark. With this investment, even if he is life orbed, I still live the Shadow Ball. And if his Inteleon goes for Snipe Shot and it critical hits, I have a really a chance to live it if he is Terra Water with this investment. So all that in there. On our next Pokemon, we have Darkrai. Now, I learned my lesson. Darkrai has shades equipped, black glasses on the black body with the black Pokemon here on the new moon. Can you appreciate the vibes with me here? We're going as dark as possible to absorb as much energy as possible from the shadows. We have Dark Pulse, Focus Blast, Sludge Bomb, and Nasty Plot. The reason for the coverage is that it hits his whole team. And the only thing that uh, it doesn't really hit is the Sneasler, but I have several other things for the Sneasler. So I, at the point where Darkrai is trying to hit Sneasler, hopefully it's just to finish it off. Uh, I could have run Psychic, but I prefer the ability to come in on something like the Inteleon or, uh, and scare that out if it's not Scarfed. Uh, it's a free swap into the Zoroark or I'm at least forcing him to go for the Focus Blast. Um, the Hatterene does hit quite hard with Dazzling Gleam, but if you brought Lantern or the Fortress, I can also use those to set up on. And really I predicted him to use the Incineroar as a pivot into my Darkrai because with the Salt Vest, he can take my hits quite well. So that is the reason for that coverage on my Dark Cry. All I needed was enough speed for the Sneasler because my Dark Cry outspeeds his entire team. That leaves our last three remaining Pokemon. Our primary Terra type Pokemon this week is going to be Choice Scarf Articuno. With Terra flying, Terra Blast, Hurricane Freeze Dry, and U-Turn, we are sure to have a terrifying sweep in the back. With Choice Scarf and Modest and the speed investment that I chose, I can outspeed Sneasler, and that's really all I need. I also really like Terra Flying for the defensive profile here because it will resist Glassy, Grassy Glide, Glassy Glide, Glassy. It will resist the Grassy Glide coming from Rillaboom. And even if he does happen to get a speed boost from something or a Choice Scarf or something like that, the natural defense naturally of my Articuno will allow me to take multiple hits there. This will also help in case he has random rock coverage somewhere. I will shed at least the ice typing so that it's not four times effective. And a little bit of bulk goes a long way with Articuno. Now, when you look at his team, you can see that the only real swap-ins to flying type moves are the Lantern and the Rhyperior. Lantern is a problem even if I use Freeze Dry, if he's specially defensive as a three hit KO. And Rhyperior is kind of pressure to Terra in this matchup. Rhyperior was actually quite difficult to prep for and I was waffling a lot about should I bring Primarina 
just so I can answer the Rhyperior. Because outside of Primarina, I will be forced to whittle it down throughout the entirety of the battle. We did just have the battle against the Rochester Rhydons with the Iron Boffin, and we learned from that matchup. And so this time, instead of running Toxic, I have Toxic Spikes on Claude Sire with Spikes, Toxic Spikes, Gunk Shot, and Recover. The idea being right alongside our Caludon, his main ways to deal with my hazards are heavily pressured by the rest of my team or allow the rest of my team this to do a lot. And I did not anticipate Hatterene to switch into Claude Sire. So that'd be a great time to set up some entry hazards because if Hatterene comes in, I'm going to just blow it up with a gunk shot. So I really enjoyed that opportunity. Our last teammate, I swapped for the last, at the last moment, I swapped out with the Primarina. I was going to run Choice Specs Primarina, but I decided to bring out my clear ambulate Grafai Eye with Terra type flying. Again, flying is a great Terra type against Seabad's team. And with Copycat, Parting Shot, Gunk Shot, and Terra Blast, if I didn't have an opportunity to Terra with my Articuno, I still wanted to have the Terra flying with the Grafai Eye. Now you will notice that Grafai Eye does not really hit Rhyperior that well, but I found out through some reading that if I use Copycat, and I copycat that Ivy Cudgel, then it will turn into a grass type Ivy Cudgel. And so that would not only give me a very strong grass type move in case he did not want to Terra his Rhyperior, but it will also help with some speed control just because if he has Grassy Glide or Unburdened Sneasler or uh, Trailblaze on the Ogre Pond or uh, Rock Polish on the Rhyperior, those are all great. Uh, I'll go first. <laughs> so I really enjoy teching that in and the clear amulet will protect my Grafai Eye's attack from Intimidate coming down from the Incineroar. So I hope you all enjoy the team. Let's get in to the matchup this week. Now then, as we have matched with Seabat on the battlefield, you can see that he has brought Rillaboom, Ogre Pond Hearthflame, Sneasler, Hatterin, Hisuian Zoroark, and the Lantern. When I saw this team preview, I breathed such a sigh of relief. Because number one, we do not have to worry about the Rhyperior that I was waffling on so much in my prep. And number two, he did not bring Inteleon, nor did he bring Fortress. So really his main way to control entry hazards has to bring bringing in Hatterin, and as for our mention in the team builder, if he brings in Hatterene, I will hit it with either a poison move or a steel move. We are going to still lead with our power herb electro shot Arcaludon in this battle because I can just see the opportunities before us. And the game plan is if we see Hatterene, I do not care if it's actually Hatterene or not, I'm going to hit it with the flash cannon. But if we see Fortress or Sneasler, then we will immediately go for electro shot. Now he does end up leading with Hatterene. And so we're gonna stick to the game plan here. I didn't know if it was Zoroark or not, and it's, it's just early in the battle. There's no way to tell anyway. So the game plan is just to hit it. Now, if it is Zoroark, he could go for Focus Blast and do a lot of damage, uh, if not outright KO me if he had, for example, Life Orb or Choice Specs. But if it is the Hatterene, Hatterene has no way to KO me here. It's also a big risk to just try to set up Stealth Rocks immediately. I did want to get a lot of entry hazards going during this battle, but if this actually is the Hatterene, I don't want to, to risk that. His opening gambit is that he goes for Trick, which in, basically to me immediately reveals that this is the Zoroark because um, you wouldn't typically run Trick on Hatterene. And he gives me a Choice Scarf, and then I critical hit him with the Flash Cannon. And that reveals that this was the Zoroark, and he took my power herb, like, yes, I'm sad that I'm missing that herb, but do you all remember two weeks ago when our Kaludon had a choice scarf? It went in. And so here, I was like, wow, okay. So I, I'm happy I ran max special attack investment, and I'm really happy I didn't click electro shot. Otherwise, he would have a very sweet free swap in here. But with the choice scarf, that most likely means that I outspeed the majority of his Pokemon, uh, except for the Sneasler and maybe the Ogre Pond, just because I didn't invest that much speed into my Arcaludon. Speaking of the Ogre Pond, he goes out to that now. And 
knowing that I have stamina for my ability, I was like, okay, he can't one hit KO me and then I'll get a defense boost. And I at least want to hit him. I also could have swapped out to my Annihilate, but with Sneasler in the back, I, I was really worried about taking a lot of extra damage on Annihilate early. But you can see here that I did consider it. The game is actually what ultimately made that decision for me uh, because I was running calcs on how much would Ogre Pond do to my Arcaladon, how much damage I would do back if I swap out and he goes for Trailblaze, how much damage would the next hit do, and then I ran out of time. <laughs> and so, of course, when you run out of time, the game just chooses the option for you. And here, that option was apparently a crit, special defense dropping flash cannon, which is amazing. Um, definitely not what I was going to do. I was going to swap out to my Annihilate. He goes for sword stance. And so here, he is primed and ready to do a lot of damage to me. But again, remember, we have that maximum defensive investment on our Caledon. And even at plus two on his offenses, if he goes for the Ivy Cudgel, which is a fire type move on this Ogre Pond, it is unlikely that it's going to be able to KO me. He would need to be able to like Terra into a Fire Blast in order to make that happen. So not now that the game chose for me and I took too long to make the decision, I'm just gonna stay in and take advantage of the special defense drop. And that second one does a lot of damage. And he goes for Trailblaze, which procs my stamina boost. So now it's like he's at plus one attack instead of plus two. That means that he's going to be doing even less damage and he's not able to KO my Arcaladon and we're able to get off another hit on him. Now he does barely live, but remember we shook off that Frenergy deal last week. We're locked in here. And although the Trailblaze does make him faster than me now, even if he takes my Arcaludon down, even if he is able to destroy this bridge, he's at low enough HP that the slightest breeze will be able to finish him off. And that means that I'm allowed to go out into my Grafi Eye and go immediately for the copycat. With Trailblaze, he would have outsped my entire team and he had super effective coverage and the Swords Dance. And so this was the only way I had of not losing like four teammates to this Pokemon. Uh, so we're gonna go out to Grafi Eye and the, the only option that I can do here is click copycat. I could parting shot, but realistically, he's still going to hit something really hard in the back. And now we get our own Ivy Cudgel off into him. So Ogre Pond is now down. So that's two teammates down on his side and one teammate down on my side. From here, there are a few different ways that he can go. He can immediately go out into the Sneasler and try to set up. He could also go into his four, uh, into his Hatterene and try to set up there too. Both of those risk coverage moves from my Grafi Eye. And that of course, that would leave his remaining Pokemon like Rillaboom um, and Lantern. Now Lantern does come in here, which immediately tells me that it's probably a bulky variant. Again, I could stay in here and go for the Ivy Cudgel. We just used it. And it looks like Ivy Cudgel to like a specially defensive Lantern would do about half damage, which is certainly not bad damage. Um, but I also know that my Claude Sire is a very, very, very free swap into the Lantern. With Water Absorb, we're immune to all of his water moves. And of course our natural ground typing means we're immune to the electric moves. That leaves him with ice moves that he could use to hit us, but those generally are not going to do very much damage to a Claude Sire with this much investment. So I do decide here, again, I was running a lot of calcs here to see which was the best option. And this time I was like, I'm not gonna let it get down to one second. <laughs> We're gonna go out to Claude Sire. But uh, I really heavily considered going for the Ivy Cudgel again with my Grafi Eye. He just goes for Volt Switch. So Grafi Eye would have been able to take that and I would have taken off about half HP from his um, Lantern. Now here, knowing that I killed Zoroark earlier, that means that Hatterene is still in the back but in my mind, I was like, there's no way he's gonna bring in Hatterene on me. I could just go for the gunk shot. And of course, right now I might even go for Earthquake. He would be taking all that extra damage for functionally no reason. However, 
I admit that I clicked spikes really hastily, the better move would have been to go for the gunk shot first. Not only does I get guaranteed damage on the lantern, which the only way the lantern can recover its HP is through rest or leftovers or some other held item, but guaranteed damage on the lantern and that would have covered the Hatterene coming in. But I was just thinking, there's no way he's gonna bring it in. But we forget in the moment that Seabad is that guy. And just like last season, he will just click buttons on you if that's the, if he wants to bring in a Pokemon, he will. And, <laughs> and so I get Spike set up on my side of the field. And so where, where some turns into this battle and my whole game plan going in was, okay, I gotta get my entry hazards. And now they're on my side of the field. Now I do go for Gunk Shot. We can see how slow he is. and He goes for a Life Orb boosted Psy Shock, which wipes out my poor Claude Sire. But the Gunk Shot, after his Life Orb damage and the poison, Claude Sire is also able to take out the Hatterene. So we have ourselves a double down. Billiam. Bring in the double downs. Yeah, boss, you want some double downs? I'll bring out some double downs. <laughs> Burgers for everyone. Gosh, I love double downs. They're so cheesy and gooey and delicious. Can't wait to pull this on TikTok. You see it over wait. there? Means crazy. William, if you are oh. recording me for like another zombie. one of your top uh, ticks, I swear hey, upon this darkness, like. I'll <laughs> cut you. I repeat, a double down. We love double downs. In the situation of a double down, most trainers will go out into their fastest available Pokemon to give them the most options for the situation. For us, that would be our choice Scarf Articuno. And you can even see here that I was, that was my first inclination was to go to Articuno. A secondary move would be to go to Darkrai because Darkrai has good coverage for everything except for the Sneasler. But because Seabat has access to several priority options, I decided to go out into my fully physically defensive Annihilate. Here I was a little bit surprised to see Lantern come back out on the field. And I'm really happy I didn't go out to my Articuno because I would have been forced to freeze dry and then he would have gotten a super effective hit on me. Now he does not know that I have Covert Cloak. And again, I have great special defensive investment here. So I decided to just go for a Drain Punch to see what type of investment he had. Not only does that bring me back to full health from the spikes, but if he decides to hit me, then that will be one hit on my Rage Fist. Now he goes for Scald not knowing that I have the Covert Cloak. Scald has a 30% chance to burn. And it's really more, it feels like 60 to 80% when you're getting hit by it, right? Like that's our perception of the probabilities when you're getting hit by Scalds. But he doesn't know that I have the Covert Cloak, so I cannot get burned here. So all he is doing is stacking up my Rage Fist. And because of the damage that Drain Fist does and the HP that Lantern has, he can hit me as much as he wants and I'm going to recover back most of that HP. He goes for a second Skull, that's two. And that means that our Rage Fist is currently at base 150 power. In our last battle, we failed to click Rage Fist when we should have, and here we are immediately going to click Rage Fist to take out the Lantern. Now, I was also running some calcs in the background with my physically defensive investment, even if he went out to the Sneasler and he had acrobatics and somehow activated it, it would not take me out from this range. And I had enough Rage Fist kind of built up that I was like, I think I can two shot a Sneasler from here pretty easily. Now I was hoping for some other opportunities to hit some more Pokemon and maybe even to get hit, but he ends up going out to Rillaboom. This has two effects on this battle. Number one, my Annihilate is going to start getting back HP from the grassy terrain. That does give his Rillaboom the priority grassy glide and it powers up his grass type moves by an additional 30%. But me, I decided to leave Annihilate in at this point. Because of my defensive investment, I figured that I could take advantage of the situation. I even considered going for U-turn because then I would probably get a slow U-turn out after the grassy glide or maybe even the wood hammer and then be able to bring in someone better. But he ends up going for swords dance. 
And while that is a great offensive boost for him, after two hits on my Rage Fist, 150 base power, and that's with no attack investment, this is a two shot. And with the grassy terrain, I'm still getting recovery even though I have not been using Drain Punch. So here, I was very certain that I could live the grassy glide, and now that's three hits on our Rage Fist, which means Rage Fist has now risen a lot in power. The real question is though, can Annihilate take a hit from Sneasler? Now, if he had acrobatics with the grassy um, terrain, then no. But here, he goes for a Dire Claw, and it does not take us out, and that's four. Four procs of the Rage Fist, which is plenty to one-shot Sneasler in this situation. And that means that once Annihilate hit this field, it did not leave, and we were able to secure a 4-0 victory over the Detroit Steel Wings. I don't know about you all, but after a battle like that, after an opponent as strong as Seabat is, it feels really empowering to have a victory underneath our belt. I'm so happy that you all got to be here and witness with me just the power of the shadows and what we can do, and especially the new moon. You you all thought I got powered up on the full moon, but the new moon, it's darker out, right? Like, we, we're not werewolves here. This is no Team Jacob or anything like that. We get powered up the darker it gets. So battling me on the new moon, it's gonna have certain consequences. Wow. So now, hmm, things to think about. If this is the type of power that we could unlock in the new moon, I wonder how much power we could unlock if we were to just really navigate through some darker realms, just like when someone's sleeping, you know, that, that really deep slumber where it's all darkness and your dreams really take light. And, and Darkrai causes bad dreams, and being the pitch black Pokemon, hmm. <laughs> Thank you all so much for watching this week's battle. Look forward to the Victorian Shadows next week when we take on Vepsis and the Helsinki Hydragons. Yet another opponent that bested us last season, that I think it's time that we try to take advantage of our position here in Draft League City. <laughs>